Hello everyone. Sorry if my voice sounds different in this video. I'm not well and my voice isn't at 100%, so sorry if it sounds a bit different. Let me just start preface to this story as to why I was traveling alone. So one of my best friends, Kayla, and I work seasonally at a hiking lodge in BC for the summer. We're both in our early 20s. She lives and goes to school in New Brunswick. I live and work as a chef in Toronto for the winter. We decided that this year, as I bought a car, instead of flying back home, we would do an epic Canadian coast-to-coast -coast road trip. Everything was going wonderfully. So wonderfully, in fact, that we ended up staying for longer in a few unexpected places and had to cut our east coast proportion for the trip short. Now, my friend Kayla started her schooling on November the 1st. So, I dropped her home in Moxon, New Brunswick on Halloween and stayed the night at her place, planning to head back to Toronto the following day. After a few glasses of Chandri and some laughs, I decided I couldn't come this close to the East Coast and not see the Cabot Trail in Nova Scotia. So, knowing I still had a week more of vacation before my winter contract, I hastily booked a hostel for the next day. November 1st, I booked from the Cabot Trail. When I booked, only one option came up. I assumed because I waited until last minute to book, a private dorm with a queen size bed for $35, I thought, what a bargain, and booked it immediately. I left Khalifa's home in Mocktown at 7am, it's a long drive. Now, the Cabot Trail is roughly 150 kilometers long, so I thought it to be safe. I'd plug the hostel address into my Google Maps and headed straight there to get my bearings. I would arrive at the hostel for roughly noon. Knowing it was too early to check in, I figured I'd consult with the front desk and figure out nearby hiking trails and bring my bags later. Now I was about to arrive at my hostel, according to Google, but all around me was nothing but farmland. Google instructed me, the destination's on your left. I saw nothing. About 50 yards ahead up the road, I saw a wire bar bent to look like a letter A. It was spray painted bright red. I was staying at a hostel that started with A, so I guessed it must be the place and followed the dirt road. It led me to what I can only describe as a barn. No signage, there were two cars parked in front, so I parked alongside and got out of my car and figured out where I was. Once I got out, a smallish man, around mid-forties with dark hair and intense eyes, popped out of the barn, saying, was I the person who booked to stay with them at the last minute? I said yeah. He wondered why and I explained my situation. Seemingly satisfied with my answer, he gave me a grand tour of the barn. The first thing that I noticed was that the entirety of the barn had been dug around. It's about five feet down and three feet around. He led me across some particle board laid down as some sort of ramp. The second thing that I noticed about the property is that there's no windows. This was clearly a barn meant for livestock. The gentleman leading me on this tour was named Kevin, the owner. He proceeded to tell me his grand plans for the place. It all seemed pretty far stretched. It was just a big old barn with some particle boarding. Most of the rooms had this in them. He led me up the skeleton stairs made out of prywood 2x4s on the cabin loft, where I would be sleeping that night, along with his family, 
the mother of his five-year-old son, his son, Kevin's own mother. The upstairs was certainly open concept. A frail curtain separated the beds with a large open area in the middle. I said if I was his only occupant, he said yeah. I had a feeling he didn't get occupants very often. I then told him that I was interested in hiking in the area and that I wanted to do so before it got dark. He gave me very detailed instructions of his favourite hikes and how to get to them. Off I went. I figured that the place wasn't ideal, and I wished the website would have let me know if that tower it actually was. But hey, I booked it last minute, beggars can't be choosers. Plus he was very friendly and giving me advice on where to hike. I hiked around until it got dark. I didn't pack enough food for the day, I figured I'd head into town for dinner. The nearest town was a clearly booming tourist destination during the summer, but in the off season, a ghost town. All the hostels and B&Bs in the area were boarded up. It was such a ghost town that even the liquor store was closed during the off season. Finally, I found a dark, dingy, empty bar to eat dinner. It was, to phrase lightly, a disappointing dinner. I had this romantic image in my head of me sitting on the harbour front, sipping on bubbly, slurping back some ocean fresh oysters. I was assured by the bartender slash cook that fried the oysters I had ordered that it was definitely not fresh. I figure with all my options for the things to do and see exhausted, I should head back to the hostel and read my book. I got back for roughly 8pm. I could smell the family livestock that lived there and miss cooking dinner. I figured that. With all my options for things to do and see exhausted, I should just head back to the hostel and read my book. I got back for roughly 8pm. I could smell the family that lived there in the middle of cooking dinner. A little boy ran down the wood steps to greet me. He yelled, My name is JP, what's yours? I say, oh, nice to meet you. I'm Alex. He immediately said, do I want to play? I said definitely, just let me put my bags down in my room first. He followed me through the translucent curtains to my room, so insisted of getting settled in. I just headed straight out into the main area. I started throwing a foam ball around with JP. His mother, father and grandmother are all just sitting down to eat without even acknowledging where we were. The mother and father just seem to have a basic argument, which turns into yelling. Completely weirded out, I told JP, I need to go to my room to call my mum, she's wondering where I am. Of course the boy doesn't understand proper boundaries yet, and follows me through the curtains to sit on my bed. I try taking his tension away from the family fighting, so I start asking him where he goes to school, his favourite colour. His mother calls for him, he doesn't answer, instead, he continues to sit there with me, not wanting to cause any problems. I yell to the mother that, he's in my room. She runs in and snatches him and yells to the father, I know what you're like when you get this angry, I'm taking JP, don't follow us. I hear her book it down the stairs and him run after her. I hear a car start up in the lot and not just drive but peel out of the driveway. I then hear him start up the excavator. I guess he wanted to let off some steam by working. Now just left upstairs is me and grandma. I walk out of my not so private curtained room and say, listen. I've got to go. She starts rubbing my arm and tells me to stay, explaining her daughter-in-law does not understand how Kevin is, and she's a real problem. Now I'm ready to tell her to go away, 
until I realise she has a knife in her hand from cooking. It's probably a 5 inch paring knife, but with intent, I'm sure it could hurt me. I don't think that she's meant it as a threat. I think she's just old and doesn't understand what she's doing. Maybe not holding the knife so close to strangers though should be obvious. So I go along with what she's saying. She rubs my other arm, with the knife getting closer. I get closer and closer to the door. She keeps rubbing my arm and shoulders with her free hand telling me stay. And how that. Her grandson is special. And before I even booked the night, he had a dream that I'd stay with them. As soon as I get out the door, I book it to my car. I start my engine up and get out of there. Kevin in the excavator decides to block the path with about a 5 foot ditch on the other side and the forest behind me. He gets out and says he's sorry and tells me that I have to stay now. Grandma runs out with the knife in hand now saying that it's Kevin's full time leaving. They argue for 5 minutes and I say that I'm calling the police. All of a sudden, they get super defensive, like I'm the unreasonable one, so I turn off my engine and start to dial. Kevin gets back in his excavator and starts backing up. As soon as he's far enough away, I see an opening on the grass, and then turn my engine back on and try and get out of there as quickly as possible. As soon as I get out of there, I call my friend Kayla no service. I remember back to earlier in the afternoon when I first got to the hostel. I was going to check my messages and saw that there was a no service sign. Even though I wanted to call the cops, I had no way to. Instead, I drove six hours straight to Mucktown on New Ben Switch and stayed with Kayla. This happened about two years ago. I'd just moved about an hour and a half away from home. The first time that I lived away, I was working on a kids activity camp. All the staff lived in two massive cabins in the woods. There were about 40 people in each, two or three per room. So you can imagine how big the cabin was. Anyway, Everybody become really close. Some people knew each other from previous years working at this particular camp. None of us really locked our doors because we all knew each other and everyone hung out in different friends rooms all the time. On this camp, my job was working with the kids during the day and doing evening shifts on the bar, which was where the staff were and the teachers and parents had to come down to the children. Now during one night, my roommate and I were both working an evening shift on the bar. She was finishing a couple of hours earlier as she was on a different shift from me. My roommate, Devs, decided that she was just going to go back to the room to read and wait for me to finish so we could catch a movie. She had been out for about five minutes when my phone started ringing with her caller ID. I picked up the call, as the bar was pretty dead that night, and the only people in there were staff. When I picked up the phone call, nobody was saying anything on the other end. I put this down to her accidentally dialing me. About a minute later, I get another phone call from a friend that lived across the hallway from us. She told me that, I needed to come back to the room now, so I asked the guy I was working with to cover me while I popped back up to the room quickly. I walked down the hallway. There were about five people just standing outside in my room. I walk inside. Debs is just standing there crying, which isn't like her at all. Our stuff was all over our room. Please note that this is very weird because I'm sure I have OCD and often tidied up my side of her room. So she went to tell me her phone had gone missing. I then asked her about phoning me before I come back to the room. 
She said she had no idea what I was on about. This means somebody had taken her phone and knew who to call immediately. Also, when she left work, there would be no point in stealing her phone as it's literally worthless. Ten pounds at the very most. A few days later, we started to notice that things had gone missing, but not normal things people would steal. They could have taken laptops, playstations, all of that crap. But no, they just took some of our rubbish, as well as some of our clothing. That made me feel ill. For a few days, I kept on getting these phone calls from Debbie's phone. Only silence awaited on the other end of the line. We obviously went and reported it to our bosses who said that they were going to look into it. We kind of got blamed for leaving our door unlocked. I understand that this was a really stupid thing now. The creepy thing is that a few days later I walked into our staff lounge and Deb's phone was just placed on the windowsill. Nobody was there, and nobody seemed to be around. Well, at that point, I noped out of there as quick as I possibly could, and locked myself in my room until Debs came back. Nothing ever came out of it. We never found out who it was, but I know for certain that they were weird as hell, because of the fact that they didn't touch anything worth value, only clothing items and rubbish. Last summer, my boyfriend and I went camping in some nature preserve in Pennsylvania. I can't remember the name. It was pretty primitive camping, no cell service, and we saw two other people there the entire time. It was huge, so it was pretty empty. My boyfriend pretty much immediately said these two people seemed off to him right away. I don't know if they had anything to do with what happened that night, but I'll describe them. The first person was a woman, who had left her truck parked off the trowel and the hood open. I don't really notice these types of things, but my boyfriend said it seemed to him like she was waiting for someone to pull off beside her and offer to help with her truck. Normally my boyfriend is the type of person to at least offer to call someone, but he said she freaked him out so much he didn't even want to draw attention more than what was necessary. The next person we saw drove by several times while we were setting up. He just kept driving by slowly and looking at us. I didn't even notice though until my boyfriend pointed out that he'd already done it twice. Whether these two people had anything sinister going on or not, the real story has to do with what woke us up at around 3am. It was incredibly loud and sudden. I couldn't even describe it or compare it to anything, but my boyfriend said it sounded to him similar to a chain gun revving up, or someone using a large tool to scrape gravel. My boyfriend jumped up and looked out the little window of the tent. The sound happened again, again and again and we'd get noticeably closer each time. I was about to piss myself, but my boyfriend told me it was probably miles off. I didn't question this because loud noises can be heard from miles off, right? Well, later my boyfriend told me he told me that because he didn't want to scare me. It really sounded like it was coming from right down the little dirt road. At one point, he said he suspected it was right in front of our campsite. The only reason he didn't tell me to get out and dart for the car was because he was afraid it could be someone trying to scare us out of the tent for some dreadful reason. He whispered, I should have noticed he was whispering and knew something was wrong, since otherwise he'd just speak normally, right? Because every little sound I heard outside sounded like someone sneaking up to the tent. Eventually, my boyfriend told me to get out and help him pack up. It was maybe 20 minutes after the sound stops. He held our only weapon, a machete in front of him. It was a full moon or close to it, so he didn't need light. While we were packing, I noticed an empty beer can close to our dead campfire. It wasn't there when we went to sleep at around 10pm, and neither of us had brought any beer. Thankfully we got out there, and for the rest of the trip, we either camped in areas that are well populated by other campers, or we got a hotel room. So whatever that was, let's never meet. I am a small, 21 year old female from Northern Ontario. I live on a fairly large plot of forest, in a small, cabin sized house with my husband and our two kids. 
My husband works about an hour away. I stay at home with the kids, who are six months old and two years old. When this incident happened, it was midwinter and very cold and snowy. My husband had been storm stayed at work because the plows had not been able to run the previous day. This isn't really unusual, given the remote area that we live in. Now it's about six o'clock, already dark. I was cleaning up the kitchen after dinner while my kids sat on the floor watching TV. There was a knock at the window besides where my kids were sitting. I looked up. Nothing was there. I then walked over to the window with my knife in hand that I'd been washing. I had a really bad feeling about this. The knock definitely sounded like one that is made by a human when they're knocking their knuckles on glass. But I saw nothing and kind of shook it off. Later that night, the knock came again. This time, in my kid's window. I had had it. I grabbed our shotgun from the locker and stepped out to our porch in pyjamas and my husband's boots. I was so angry. I wasn't about to let some idiot mess with my kids. I screamed. I know you're there, and if you don't go away and leave my kids alone, I'm gonna kill you. There was no answer. Nevertheless, I somehow knew that there was still somebody out there, so I cocked my gun and fired it round into the air so whoever it was knew I wasn't messing around. Not the smartest or safest thing to do, I know, but what else could I do? Besides, it worked. There was a rustling from outside around my home where a man ran off into the trees. Keep in mind, it's about minus 30 celsius. I stood there for about 5 minutes, making sure that he didn't come back. Then I went in and called my husband and the police. Thank God, the police were able to come out despite the weather and looked everywhere around our home and caught the guy wandering through the woods about half a kilometre away. I don't know what happened after they arrested him, but he never come around again. My friend and I decided to head up to a remote part of the Chattahoochee National Forest to spend our Friday night and Saturday night out camping. I have been camping before, but this was going to be the first time doing it deep in the woods, with basically no human contact within a 5 and 10 mile radius, and no cell service. We set up camp near an old logging path. Once we got settled into camp, we made some dinner, and shortly after getting cleaned up, it was completely dark and out in the woods it is the darkest I have ever seen. As the fire started to burn out, we decided to call it a night and head for our tents. At this point, I was already having trouble sleeping. If you've ever experienced the quietness of the woods, you know it's so quiet that it's loud. Every twig snap and rustle in the leaves had me freaking out. I fell asleep finally after about an hour. I woke up late in the night to the sound of a large truck and a dog barking like crazy. My friend's tent was right in front of mine, so immediately hear him whisper to me, Wake up, now. I can hear the sound of his shotgun pumping as I'm grabbing the machete I have in my tent. The truck is now driving directly next to our camp, and this dog is still going nuts. He stops, gets out, and starts screaming incomprehensible shit. It sort of sounded like somebody yelling at a concert with no music playing. Then he takes a piss on the trees and starts laughing hysterically. After what felt like an hour, this guy gets back in his truck and speeds off. We both think it may have been some guy that comes out here to do drugs or other types of legal stuff, but to me it looked and sounded like someone who was completely mentally insane. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. <laughs> 